Well, friends, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I was all on my own. I was surrounded by wilderness and trees, and I was on the run. But I wasn't all alone. The enemy was closing in from all directions. And so, gun in hand, I crawled on my hands and my knees under this old abandoned pickup truck. I was hoping they wouldn't see me. But they did. They saw me. They approached and they opened fire, and I was pelted with paintball gun with paintballs. It wasn't a very pretty sight. <laughs> you, you know, when we pray, lead us not into temptation, we pray that because we are in a war zone. And it's not just a round of paintball at a bachelor party. These words lead us not into temptation. Those are fighting words. Those words are a battle cry. Those words are an act of war. And it's an act of war because the kingdom of darkness has invaded God's world. The kingdom of darkness took you as a prisoner of war that is, until God rescued you in your baptism. And because God claimed you as his own in your baptism, that means that you have a target on your back. Satan has it out for you. And that means that he tries to provoke you, seduce you, bait you into committing treason against the kingdom of heaven. And that's why we pray, lead us not into temptation, that we might commit treason. You know, in John 12, verse 25, Jesus says this. We just heard this a couple moments ago. Whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Here's the thing about temptation. Not giving in to temptation feels like hating yourself. It's hard not to give in to temptation because a temptation is usually something that feels good. Giving in feels good. Giving in feels like loving yourself. And that's because there is a sinner who lives inside of you. And that sinner tempts you to lust after other people as objects for your own pleasure. That sinner inside of you tempts you to be lazy so that you don't have to do the hard work of serving other people. And that sinner inside of you tempts you to gluttony and drunkenness and greed to make your life all about you. And that's why giving in feels good. It feels like loving yourself. And then, it's not just that sinner that lives inside of you, then the world attacks your flank, and it uses your own relationships with others against you, tempting you to give in to anger and impatience and hatred, and hostility, and violence, and vengeance, and cursing, and slander, and envy, and arrogance. And you want to feel all those things because, you know what, really God should have put better people in your life, and you have to put up with these people, and that's why giving in even to those negative emotions feels good. It feels 
like loving yourself. And then, after you've been softened up by a missile barrage of temptations, Satan goes in for the final blow. He tempts you to ignore, or even better yet, despise God's word and God's works. See, Satan's plan is textbook divide and conquer. Isolate you from God and then go in for the kill. He wants to tear you away from your faith. He wants to destroy all your hope and and destroy all your dependence on God. Which means, if we're talking about temptation, temptation to sin, What that means is that all sin is believing that God is holding out on a better life for you. That's what temptation and sin really is. I mean, it goes all the way back to the the very first sin, right? Satan tricked Adam and Eve. He, He led them to believe that God was holding out on them, that God didn't want them to eat that fruit because then they would be like him, and so they were tempted to have their own life. And it felt like loving themselves. All sin tells you, all temptation lies to you, that God God does not really love you, so you must love yourself by doing things your own way. And friends, the truth is, is that until Christ returns, Satan's shelling will be constant. The temptations will not stop, which means that you must be prepared for war. And that is why Jesus teaches us to pray, lead us not into temptation. And and, and in that prayer, it might be a prayer that God would protect you from those temptations at all. But but friends, the truth is, is that you can't just rely on those temptations never coming because they will until Jesus comes back. Which is why that prayer is not just asking that God would remove the temptation. It's praying that you won't give in to temptation. This prayer, lead us not into temptation, it is calling in reinforcements. It's calling up to God for strength that can only come from God. You know, Hebrews 2 verse 18 says this. Let's read this together. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Friends, this is talking about Jesus. Jesus suffered real temptation. And it wasn't just pretend temptation. He suffered temptation to the point where it was possible for him to give in to temptation. It was possible. And then Jesus did for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Even though he suffered temptation, even every temptation common to man, even though he suffered temptation, he never gave in and he never sinned. And he does that for you. He never gave in. It wasn't just for himself. Jesus, by living that life and suffering real temptation, was answering that prayer. Lead us not into temptation. And and friends, Jesus gives you his same Holy Spirit as divine air support to help you resist temptation. Which means you don't need to go into battle against temptation feeling like you're going to lose. 
feeling like you're the underdog because you have the Lord on your side, which means that you can fight it tooth and nail. You can resist it because you know what true love is. You know that life is not actually found in giving in to the temptation, but in resisting it. That is the true life that God gives to you. And by the way, you never go alone into battle. You have the Holy Spirit at your back, but you also have the church, the church that God gave you. He gave you a, a church full of comrades, which means that this church is, well, should be a safe place to admit your struggles and to find reinforcements because we are together in war. But I have to say, I think that historically the church has struggled with that. Just, just as an example, I, I grew up in purity culture. You, you might remember what purity culture was or, or sometimes still is, and, and you might have heard a lot of news stories about purity culture in recent years and all that, but I, I grew up in purity culture. And I, I will say this, uh, on the one hand, purity culture had a positive message of encouraging you to resist temptation and, and to honor God's gift of sexuality. But there is also a dark side. The dark side of purity culture was that it said that your purity was solely kept or lost based on your sexual purity. And it objectified your body and others' bodies by saying that they were temples that could be violated permanently. And it shamed you for even being sexually tempted and demanded that your sheer will to resist temptation would be godly enough for you to stay pure. But friends, that's not the gospel. Nor is that what Jesus teaches us to pray. Because the truth is, Try as you might, and you should try, but try as you might, you live in that war zone. And try as you might, you will give in to temptation. Because until Jesus comes back, you are still a sinner. But the good news is that what saves you is not simply resisting temptation. What saves you is not just believing that there's a God up there. Because you know who else believes that? Satan. And I'll even go so far as to say, what saves you is not just believing that Jesus died on the cross. Because you know who else believes that? Satan. What saves you is believing that what Jesus did on the cross is for you. That is a saving faith, which means that sinning is not game over. The only game over is losing your hope in Jesus because the gospel is that Jesus atones for your sins to make you pure. That's what saves you. Believing that Jesus' shed blood on the cross covers every single one of your sins. Friends, which means that in this war zone that we live in, forgiveness is heaven's nuclear strike against temptation that Satan can't do anything about. Forgiveness is heaven's unfair advantage against hell. Forgiveness is the real life respawn button. Forgiveness means that you get back into the fray to resist temptation, and to resist Satan. 
Forgiveness means that even if it is the one millionth time that you have given in to temptation, you again pray it and you confess it and you receive forgiveness. And, and, and by the way, that's what your fellow Christians are for. And, and that's what your pastor is for. Forgiveness giving people. And, and I just want to extend that invitation to you. If there is a sin or a struggle that you have that, that you feel like, like is, is condemning you, that, that, that's got you by the throat, you know those kinds, whether it's small or it's big, come and find me. And I promise you that I will, I will declare Jesus' forgiveness to you over even that sin. Because that's the gospel. And you know, that's, that's why we celebrate Palm Sunday. We hail Jesus as our only Lord. Sometimes temptation feels like a Lord, doesn't it? But on Palm Sunday, we hail Jesus as our only Lord. And we hail Jesus as our only Savior. You are not your own Savior against your temptations. Jesus is our only Savior, and he is our only King who can save us. Jesus is our only hope. And Palm Sunday is when Jesus rides into Jerusalem to be crucified because it is the only way that we can be saved Palm Sunday is when Jesus goes willingly behind enemy lines to deliver the payload of forgiveness. And that is why the people shout, whether they realized it or not, that's why the people shout, Hosanna, save us. Because Palm Sunday is heaven's D-Day when Jesus marches toward Good Friday to win the war. You know, Martin Luther puts it this way uh, in his explanation to the sixth petition. If you can see this, go ahead and read this with me. God tempts no one. We pray in this petition that God would guard and keep us so that the devil, the world, and our sinful nature may not deceive us or mislead us into false belief, despair, and any other great shame and vice. Although we are attacked by these things, we pray that we may finally overcome them and win the victory. You know, I'll say this. I want you to go back and feel encouraged to resist and to fight tooth and nail against your sins and temptations because that is where true life is found for you. But friends, the, the, what's truly at stake is not, not just you sinning. What's truly at stake is you believing the gospel because that's, that's really what Satan is trying to do to you. He's trying to make you sin so that you either say, you know what, I don't need any of that forgiveness stuff. I really enjoy sinning. Or to make you feel like I'm too far gone. Not even the gospel can save me. That's Satan's ultimate battle strategy. Friends, believe the gospel. And when we pray as a church... Lead us not into temptation. We are praying as struggling sinners for struggling sinners. And that also means that when you pray that, it might mean that you might be God's answer to someone else's prayer to help them in their temptation. So that means that you need to be ready to go to war for somebody else and with somebody else. 
Because you know what? That's what the church is. The church is a field hospital. The church is a reinforcement camp. The church is a training ground. The church is a radio tower for divine air support. The church is a rally point to the cross. And dear Christian, when you pray, lead us not into temptation. You pray a prayer that ultimately has already been answered. And whether your battle is against alcohol or drugs or anger or porn or jealousy or resentment or gossip or whatever your battle might be, the gospel has already claimed you. And that means that the victory is already yours. And you fight in a battle that has already been won. When we pray, lead us not into temptation, we're praying, Hosanna, save us to the only one who can. In Jesus' name, amen.